Up until pretty recently, the stuff that's on stage with me was actually considered trash. Think back to the last time maybe you were hurt, or maybe you know someone who needs to use this stuff regularly. Well, what probably ends up happening is you get prescribed this stuff, you use it for whatever amount of time you need to, but then what happens to it? That was Mohan Sudabatula, the founder and CEO of Project Embrace, speaking during a TEDx talk in Salt Lake City back in 2018. Welcome to tonight's In Focus topic, Project Embrace. Joining us tonight is the person you saw at the beginning of this segment, Mohan Sudabatula. Mohan, thank you so much for being here tonight. Thanks for having me, Rosie. So Mohan, we got to hear a little bit of a tease of what Project Embrace is, but tell us about it and where did the idea come from? Yeah, so Project Embrace is a medical nonprofit organization based here in Salt Lake City. And what we do is collect uh, gently used durable medical equipment from patients who no longer need them. You know, things like crutches, walkers, wheelchairs, what have you. Clean them up, repurpose them, and get them out to patients in low resource settings all around the world who otherwise can't afford it. So where did the idea come from? I understand there is a personal story behind like the development of this idea. Yeah, yeah. So I uh, was volunteering at a local hospital, Shriners Hospital for Children, um, just right in downtown Salt Lake City, where I worked as a prosthetics and orthotics technician. And the thing about orthotics and prosthetics is, especially with kids, um, children outgrow them really quickly. And I was the person who would have to take these things from the families and wield them out to the dumpster and quickly realized that that was something that didn't sit well with me. It was something that I considered to be wasteful and started to kind of snowball and play with the idea and look at more generalizable equipment like crutches and wheelchairs and realized that that stuff was also being prematurely thrown out and uh, thought back to my family's story in India and being a first gen American, I connected two dots and started just thinking about all those faces and all those people that I personally know that could benefit from things like this. And uh, from that Project Embrace blossomed. That's incredible. I can relate to you on that. My mom <laughs> always told me growing up, don't be wasteful. Always find a way to repurpose or reuse something before you really make the decision to throw it away, right? Exactly. All right. So tell me about the demographic of people that have benefited from Project Embrace's services and donations. Right. Yeah. So I'm really happy to say that just this past month, we hit our 750th patient, which is really exciting for us. And um, we have served a variety of people going anywhere from undocumented patients refugees, orphans, to indigenous populations, to even those that are incarcerated. And really what we're looking for are people that fall through the cracks of public health and fall through um, some of the, some of just the gaps. And uh, yeah, we uh, more recently have been working a lot with the homeless population here in Salt Lake City as well, but really those that are facing hard times and those that need the most help. That's, that's, an, that's incredible. It. Congratulations. Okay, 750 patients. I want to put that into perspective. How long have you guys been around? Yeah, so we actually hit our third anniversary just this past Halloween. So uh, I started it as an undergrad uh, a few years ago. And uh, yeah, here we are three years later, three years in a few days. <laughs> okay, so who can donate to Project Embrace and what types of items are you looking for? Right, well, anyone can donate and we're looking for all sorts of things that uh, are technically considered durable medical equipment. So crutches, walkers, wheelchairs, commodes, bedside assistant uh, technology, anything like that, slings, braces, the kind of stuff that is probably laying around in your closet. Those are the things that we specialize in. Those are the things that we give away to patients who need them. Now, Mohan, is there any other organization in Utah that's doing something similar to what Project Embrace is doing? So what's really interesting about Project Embrace is we are one of only a handful of organizations throughout the nation that works exclusively with used medical equipment, right? Like there's a lot of nonprofits out there that give away surplus medical equipment, but Project Embrace is new in that we're really challenging what we are considering to be waste. And so uh, I can proudly say that there really aren't a lot of organizations that I can think of personally that do what Project Embrace is doing in the nation, nonetheless, Utah. I was gonna say, I haven't really heard of anyone doing something like this until I met you. Yeah. How are you guys funded? Yeah, so we, we're funded a handful of ways, you know, like with whether it's through community support and donations, grant funding, or through private contracts to help us work with isolated patient populations, you know, to help us cover some of the logistic fees to actually reach the patient. But uh, for the most part, a lot of our money up until this point in time has been bootstrapped from the community because, you know, we're, we're getting a sense of our bearings, we're figuring out our stride, and uh, we're really supported by, you know, everyone who's, who's watching this program and uh, from our local community members. 
Tell me about your team. How many members do you guys have yeah. and do you guys need more help or volunteers? Yeah, we have a lovely team of seven right now and a couple of interns and uh, they are just phenomenal workers. Um, as of right now, you know, like it, it takes a small but dedicated team to make this happen. And we all, we, we all are great friends. We love doing what we do. But there are incredible volunteer opportunities. Now, we usually have a really big volunteer day where we invite members of the community to help us come and clean and refurbish our medical equipment. But unfortunately, with COVID, that's become a closed off event. But typically, we invite anywhere from 30 to 50 people from anywhere to come in and help us out. But we're looking forward to the day where we can have those events again and have everyone come back out. But it really does take the entire community to feel empowered to make a difference. Tr true words right there. I agree with you wholeheartedly. Um, real quick, just we have because we have about 30 seconds left. Can you give us a quick tease about what your next project is going to be? We're going to meet somebody in this next block, and I just want to give our viewers a transition to that. So give us a little tease about what your next yes. project is. So we are going back out to the Navajo Nation during the holiday season, and uh, we're really excited to do so. But yeah, well, that's I think that's the tease, right? <laughs> yeah, and we're going to talk about that later in the show. So hold that thought because we do have to take a quick commercial break, but we're going to see you later in the show. When we come back, we'll hear from Navajo Strong about their collaboration with Project Embrace. Odds are it ends up just collecting dust in our closets and basements and then goes to the thrift store and then later the dump. But look at these things. They're meant to last. They're not built to be used once and disposed of. That was Mohan Sudabatula, the founder and CEO of Project Embrace, talking during a TEDx talk in Salt Lake City back in December 2018 about how they collect previously used medical equipment and repurpose them for patients in low resource settings. Thanks for staying with us for our In Focus topic tonight, Project Embrace. Their next project takes the organization down to Navajo Nation. Joining us tonight is Meredith Little, the volunteer program director for Navajo Strong. Meredith, thank you so much for joining us tonight. It's nice that we can actually catch you while you're here in Salt Lake. Yeah, it's, a, it's good to be here and uh, just wanted to mention it's also National Native American Heritage Month, month of November, so oh. I'm happy to be here. Well, Thanks for having me. Yeah, uh, Meredith, tell me about the needs of tribal members on Navajo Nation. Uh, the needs are many, you know, um, later I'll be talking a little bit more about Navajo Strong and exactly what we do, but the, the needs of the Navajo Nation are vast because of the ruralness of the area, but not to mention the mass um, you know, area of the land itself. Um, there are 13 grocery stores in the entire Navajo Nation. Uh, so getting to a grocery store is difficult. Um, there are six hospitals that are Indian health centers, uh, seven health centers, and I believe 15 other stations on the Navajo Reservation. So to get from grocery store to hospital, you really have to go to the nearest um, city on the, on the Navajo Reservation. It, it's, it can get very, very distance-wise, can make things a lot difficult for uh, the members there. Now, has the need increased during the COVID-19 pandemic, especially because residents are told to stay at home whenever possible? Plus, there's been several mandated lockdowns on the reservation by President Jonathan Nez. Correct, yeah, they've had like a 56-hour lockdown. Uh, things have been really just, you know, devastating. I believe they are going through their second wave is what they're experiencing right now on the Navajo Reservation. Um, things are hard, um, not to mention, you know, just the distance that people have to travel to get to what, get to a grocery store or to the hospital or where they need to go. Um, it's, it's very limiting and it's difficult. I want to get to your organization. Tell me about Navajo Strong and what your organization's mission is. Navajo Strong was born um, out of the need of COVID-19. Um, the last major, I would say, pandemic that actually occurred on the Navajo Reservation was hantavirus back in the 90s. Um, my father was a physician on the Navajo Reservation um, during that time, and so I have some clear memories of, of that alone um, happening on the reservation. But right now, with COVID-19, as you know, we do have on the Navajo Reservation, the largest per capita infection rate in the country. And so the need is very great and um, it's been devastating. 
Tell me about how the partnership with Project Embrace came about. How do they fit into what your organization's mission is? Well, um, we're very fortunate and lucky to have Mohan. Um, and we were just so grateful to him and that collaboration that was born out of this time of need. Um, Mohan has been wonderful because he really embraces the mission of Navajo Strong. And in Navajo we say, Dinepitzil, which means Navajo Strong, and that is what we stand for. And we are um, just really for supporting the ancestry of the Navajo people, um, the history, and the strength, the strength of our people. And so with Mohan's collaboration, we've been able to help a lot of people on the reservation, especially the elders who are needing a lot of help right now. Uh, going off of your answer there, tell me about how Project Embraces has helped the tribal members uh, meet the needs and what's the impact that their project is going to have on the recipients on the reservation? Well, like I said before, you know, there are six hospitals that are located on the Navajo Reservation. The wait time as far as, you know, supplies and whatnot that does come onto the Navajo res Reservation is a long wait time. and so. With Project Embrace, what's wonderful is that, you know, especially with the walkers and the crutches, people are able to get those supplies right away, rather than waiting and waiting for what could take weeks. That's awesome. Um, last question for you. What do you want people at home to know, whether it's about Navajo Strong, whether it's about Navajo Nation, or even Project Embrace's next project? Well, I just really want people to know that, you know, if anything, we are so grateful because I think the Navajo Nation has really relied on outside donations. Um, as we know, federal funding can get caught up and it can take a while to process. Um, right now, they are trying to do a hardship um, program, which has been taking a while. But what's really great about Project Embrace and the people who have really chipped in to help on the Navajo Reservation is that that help has been immediate. And so that is the whole purpose of Navajo Strong is to get immediate help. And right now we are working on some housing projects that are gonna be helping elders and uh, people on the Navajo Reservation who are in dire need of home improvement before the winter months come. I absolutely love what you guys are doing both with Navajo Strong and Project Embrace. All right, folks, you've been hearing from Meredith Little with Navajo Strong. Thank you so much for being here tonight. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. In recognizing how wasteful that was, I started Project Embrace, a nonprofit organization that's dedicated to collecting previously owned durable medical equipment and redistributing them so they can be repurposed by patients in low resource settings worldwide. That was Mohan Suda Batula, the founder and CEO of Project Embrace, speaking during a TEDx talk in Salt Lake City back in December 2018. Welcome to our third and final segment of our in focus topic tonight, Project Embrace. Mohan joins us again live in studio, but this time with Sam Phillips, the Salt Lake City Chapter Executive Director for their nonprofit organization via Zoom. Gentlemen, we'll pick up right where we left off. Mohan, tell me about Project Embrace's next donation campaign to Navajo Nation. We did tease it in t the last two segments, but what are your goals and who will be assisted by this project? Right, yeah, so our goals are to go back to the Navajo Nation um, and try and get there right before peak flu season to try and assist those that um, are going to have even harder access to uh, medical equipment and services. And so we're really hoping that we can get there ahead of time to equip professionals that are already doing an amazing job on the reservation to optimize the amount of patients that can be treated. And uh, you know whether that be the elderly population, the geriatric population, or those who just need some help being able to get around and participate in their community during this troubled time, that's who we're looking to help serve. All right. All right, so Sam Mohan talked about going down before flu season. Let's talk about the timeline now. When will your organization travel down to Navajo Nation? And what are the financial means or resources that you need to get down there? Yeah, definitely. So we'll be traveling to the Navajo Nation December 13th through December 16th. Uh, as Mohan said, just right as flu season begins to pick up. In terms of the financial requirements, uh, we need about $3,500 and fundraising to complete our logistics costs. This allows us to provide these devices to our community partners and to the patients on the Navajo Nation at no cost to them. Um, so it's really just to help us transport the, those devices down there and uh, you know, do the best we can with uh, the money that we have. 
I've been down to Navajo Nation three times uh, for work purposes and to do reports down there and I know that it's quite a drive. It can be anywhere from like six to ten hours and so I commend you guys for making the trip down there and helping those in need. Uh, Sam, I understand you guys have worked with Navajo Nation before. Why work again with them after your previous campaign this past summer? Definitely. So the Navajo Nation, it's a very large area and so we were just barely able to get um, a little ways into it almost just barely scratched the surface and so we felt like going back would be really important to further the good um, and, and the help that we can provide to the Navajo Nation um, you know just just along with that it's uh, excuse me it's it's really important for us to, to continue this this partnership um, a single time is great, but that con uh, consistent relationship is really important for long-term good. Now, Mohan, um, I absolutely love our viewers because many times we've had uh, guests on our show and then we've had viewers reach out wanting to help. Um, how can people at home watching help out with this project if they're interested? Absolutely, that's a great question. So like I was mentioning earlier, really, any of the work we do is only possible if it uh, w if community members get involved. And so, like I mentioned, we typically have a large volunteer day where we open it up to the community, but unfortunately it has to be closed off due to COVID regulations. Uh, we look forward to opening that back up in the near future, but for the time being, it really is just about helping us get to the Navajo Nation and make sure that we can be out there for uh, the appropriate amount of time and really meet the patients where they're at. And so like Sam was mentioning, we have a fundraiser that's currently going on. We just kicked it off a couple days ago where we're trying to fundraise $3,500 to cover all of the costs to deliver tens of thousands of dollars worth of medical equipment to over 200 patients in need. So a financial contribution goes a really long way. And uh, if people would really like to help, it would be to help get us out there through a small financial contribution. Now, uh, it's been about three years since you started this organization and it's grown quite a bit. You've got a team now, you've got, you know, you celebrated your milestone 750th patient. How does it feel to like be here three years later now and see how far the organization has come? You know, that is, that's a great question. And it has just been the most fulfilling and wild ride, whether that be traveling, you know, abroad to you know, visiting our neighbors in Southern Utah, there's always this just the opportunity to be able to work with patients and to be able to help genuinely improve the quality of life for someone so they can better engage with their community is always so rewarding and it's always so uh, just it's always fun to be able to you know take something like crutches from a closet in Draper Utah and give it to someone who now needs those things to be able to participate more in their community and to be able to transcribe and translate that story back to our community locally to show them that everyone really can make a difference in context of healthcare by getting involved is something that I honestly live for. I, I love being able to uh, string that narrative together and love being able to continue to help patients. And so uh, it's, been, it's been a phenomenal journey and I'm really excited to see where we'll be this time next year or even in a few months or three years from now, who knows? But it's, it's been an amazing, amazing right. journey. We, I commend you guys so much. I absolutely love this project. We have about 15 seconds left. Really important information. Sam, I'm gonna hand this last question over to you. Where can people find you guys? Social media, websites, tell us how people can now find you. Yeah, please go to our website, projectembrace.org. We do have an Instagram, uh, Project Embrace. So we really encourage you to follow us on there, uh, interact with us, and uh, especially as uh, hopefully we begin to interact more with the community, um, just, just keep a look out there. All right, folks, you've been hearing from Mohan Suda Batula and Sam Phillips with Project Embrace. Guys, thank you so much for being here tonight. Thanks for having us, Rosie.